As you travel across the Anorak Desert and meet the Bedeen people, sharing cups of tea around a little fire in the cold and clear desert nights, you hear a lot of legends and stories about giant spiders fighting giant scorpions, and I've seen some terrible examples of both. But the Kalam Desert and the large caves near Menzo Baranzan have the most monstrous scorpions in Faerun. Scorpions are considered part of the arachnid family on Earth, but on Toril, they're not considered a part of spider kind, and consider that this includes the Driders, which includes the many living un around Menzo Baranzan. The Chitain, the Beblith, the Arania, which includes the many living in the Kalam Desert, uh, Etikaps, Neogi, Spalgaunts, uh, Mylotra, and the Childrith, plus a few more intelligent and non-intelligent spider things. The Scorpions and the half-humanoid, half-scorpion Chinchali are not included, even though there are a few arachnids in the list which should be considered scorpions, but more on those in a moment. The Flynn Charlies are still a huge problem in the nation of Arm, not that far from Candlekeep as the crow flies. In 1374 DR, some 125 years ago now, an army of Tlin Charlies surged out of the underdark, uh, the underdark beneath Arm and attacked the sailor city, which in Arm is now known as Morandon, the kingdom of ogres, orcs and giants. A lot has been going on in that region and not a great many know to steer well clear of Mirandon, but humans and elves certainly should, halflings doubly so, considering we are a culinary delicacy among those races. More on that later. The important part is that not too far from the prosperous city of Athcatla, over the Small Teeth Mountain Pass is a kingdom of monsters and all around that region can be found an alarming number of Tlingkalis, the scorpion people, who are highly unpleasant. The Tlingkalis or scorpion folk are a chimeric blend of human and arachnid. Their upper bodies resemble those of humans, while their lower halves are those of enormous scorpions, complete with formidable stingers. These creatures clad in natural chitinous armour roam the arid deserts, hunting during the twilight hours and finding refuge from the extreme temperatures by burying themselves in loose sand or seeking shelter in ruins or shallow caves. Tlingkalis are nomadic by nature, lingering only as long as the hunting in the area remains fruitful. Their campsites are transient, chosen for proximity to resources and safety for their young, which, uh, when it's time to lay eggs, the females deposit them in warm, concealed locations, often among strands of cacti. These eggs are encased in hard shells coated with a paralytic poison, a defense mechanism ensuring that most predators are incapacitated if they attempt to breach them. These creatures are pragmatic hunters, consuming whatever they catch, but be it desert wildlife or unfortunate caravans crossing their path, hmm, however, when they have young to feed, they exhibit a chilling behavior, capturing prey alive. They paralyze them and with their spiked chains, reserve these captives for their offspring. As night falls, the young Chinkalis emerge from their lairs to feed, a gruesome initiation to their predatory existence. Among the Tlingalis, uh, there exists a profound respect for skilled hunters. They're keenly aware of their standing in the food chain and will either serve, avoid, or confront superior hunters, such as blue dragons. Based on a calculated assessment of risk and reward, this pragmatic approach underscores their survivalist culture, one where strength and cunning are paramount. Despite this prowess, Tlingalis are really engaged in complex crafting or city building. Their tools and weapons are rudimentary, forged from scavenged materials. However, their spike chains and natural weapons are far more than sufficient for their needs, a mark of their adaptability and resourcefulness. For those venturing into the realms where tin gullies roam, understanding their capabilities is crucial. These large monstrosities boast a natural armor class of 15, a reflection of their hardy chitinous exoskeletons. They have 85 hit points indicating their resilience and a speed of 40 feet which speaks to their agility in their harsh desert environment. Their physical prowess is further evident by their strength and constitution scores both at 16 granting them a formidable plus 3 modifier. Dexterity though slightly lower at 13 still provides a plus 1 modifier ensuring that they're not easily caught off guard. Their mental faculty faculties are less pronounced with an intelligence of 8 but their wisdom at 12 and charisma at 8 point to a keen survival instinct, instinct, but a lack of social grace. In terms of skills, they excel in perception, stealth, survival, each with a plus 4 modifier, allowing them to be both elusive predators and adept trackers. Their dark vision extends to 60 feet, enabling them to hunt effectively under the cover of darkness and, of course, in their natural underground environment. 
Their passive perception of 14 ensures they're really surprised. Linguistically, they communicate in their own tongue. Tlingkali as a language is harsh and guttural. Their challenge rating of 5 with an experience point value of 1800 marks them as fairly formidable opponents for adventurers. Tlingkali's multi-attack in combat allows it to strike with its longsword or spiked chain and its venomous sting. The longsword attack with a plus 6 to hit and dealing 1d8 plus 3 slashing damage or 1d10 plus 3 if wielded two-handed demonstrates their proficiency with simple yet effective weaponry. With a plus 6 to hit, the spike chain reaches up to 10 feet, dealing 1d6 plus 3 piercing damage and potentially grappling and restraining foes with a DC 11 escape difficulty. And remember these things attack in groups, so that DC is going to catch you out at some point. Their sting, however, is their most fearsome weapon. It is a significant threat with a plus 6 to hit and dealing 1d6 plus 3 piercing damage plus 4d6 poison damage. The accompanying DC 14 constitution saving throw to avoid being poisoned and possibly paralyzed adds a chilling dimension to their attacks. The ability for the target to repeat the saving throw at the end of the turn provides a glimmer of hope for those ensnared by this deadly appendage, but it doesn't give you immunity to their poison. One cold morning, as I journeyed along the mountain pass road headed to Athcatla, I witnessed firsthand the deadly efficiency of these creatures. Snow had begun to fall, a harbinger of the heavy snows that would soon close the pass for the season. The caravan captain, believing it safe to make passage before the worst weather set in, had pushed forward with a string of wagons laden with goods. As they neared a narrow stretch of the pass, the Tlingkali struck. They emerged from the shallow pits filled with warm oil, an adaptation that baffled me at the time but speaks to their cunning in overcoming the cold mountain habitat. Used to the more tropical temperatures of the Underdark and the distant land of Mastica, they had taken to wearing furs, blending eerily with the snow-dusted landscape. The attack was swift and brutal. The Tlingkalis, wrapped in furs and armed with their spike chains, descended upon the caravan with deadly precision. They moved with startling agility, the chitinous legs propelling them easily over the snow-covered ground. The caravan guards were caught off guard, fought valiantly, but were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer ferocity of the scorpion folk. I watched as the Tlingkalis used their stingers to paralyze the guards, their bodies crumpled into the snow as venom took hold. Those who managed to resist the initial onslaught found themselves ensnared by the spike chains, their struggles futile against the relentless grip of their captors. Realising the dire situation, the caravan captain ordered a retreat, but it was too late. The Klinklalis were not interested in slaughter alone. They sought captors for their young, and as the snow continued to fall, they began binding the paralysed and wounded to the rocky outcrops and sparse trees along the pass. The sight was both horrific and mesmerising, a display of the cold efficiency these desert dwelling hunters. As the caravan remnants fled back down the pass, I remained hidden, observing the Tlingkalis as they secured their captors and retreated to their oil-filled pits. The snow, now falling heavily, began to cover the tracks of their attack, leaving behind only the airy silence of the mountains and the distant muffled cries of those left behind. One or more blue dragons in the Small Teeth mountain range may be orchestrating this invasion of scorpion folk. The blue dragon, or dragons, might have innovated this warm oil method and the use of furs to keep the Tlingkali active above the Underdark, even in winter months in the mountains. If this is the case, it could be a disaster for the whole region, even worse than a monster city ruled by the very devious and ambitious ogre mages of Mirandon. The machinations of a blue dragon are not to be underestimated, and their cunning and ambition know no bounds. If these creatures are under such a powerful influence, the threat to Athcatla and the surrounding lands is more dire than previously imagined. Oh yeah, before I end this entry in my journal, I should talk about the Europagus and the Solifugid, two relatives of the giant scorpions who often get included in the category of spider kind. Europagus, also known as the giant whip scorpion, giant pedipalps or monstrous Europagids, are, or occasionally the giant vinegaroons, are formidable creatures found primarily in the Underdark, particularly near drow cities like Menzobranzan. They are the largest type of pedipalpi, with segmented bodies covered in spiny bone-armoured exoskeletons. Their appearance is intimidating, with long spindly legs and a scorpion-like tail that ends in a stinger resembling a scorpion. The Europagus is often nicknamed the giant vinegaroon due to its ability to spray a yellow, sultry and acrid gas up to three times a day, affecting those with a 20-foot radius uh, within a 20-foot radius with uncontrollable spasms and tremors. 
Their eyes are small but sharp, capable of seeing a near total darkness, aiding them in their nocturnal hunts and survival in the depths of the Underdark. Solifugids, also known as false spiders, camel spiders or sun spiders, are intriguing arachnids with unique adaptations that set them quite apart from traditional spiders. Their segmented bodies covered in fur, ranging from brown to yellowish hues, provide camouflage in their desert habitats. Their eyes gleam with a glossy green, black or red hue, adding to their fearsome appearance. Unlike typical spiders, solifugids lack developed pincers but possess hooked beaks and ten powerful legs. Their foremost legs are equipped with muscular forejoints and hooked clamps, allowing them to maintain a solid grip on their prey. Solifugids are known for their agility and speed, capable of moving swiftly across desert sands or rocky terrain. They have immunity to most forms of poison and can see in areas of total darkness, giving them a significant advantage in hunting. Europicus and Solifugids are carnivorous creatures feeding on various prey, though the Solifugus avoid consuming other Solifugids, finding their flesh to be abhorrent, which you can use to your advantage. Each species has adapted to different habitats. Large Solifugids prefer hot climates like those found in Kalimshan and Anorak, emerging at night when temperatures are cooler. Huge Solifugids roam temperate wastelands such as the Shar and Roran deserts, often ambushing prey in gullies or rocky outcrops. Giant Solifugids inhabit the underground regions of temperate climates, particularly within the Underdark, where they are formidable predators. Full stat blocks for the 5th edition can be found in, well, on my Patreon page. The Tsunkali stats are already part of 5th edition. You can find them in Morden Kanan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse on page 243. My name is AJ Pickett, also known as Pickaroon Highhand, the lawkeeper in these journals. Thanks for listening, and as always, I'll be back with more for you very soon. <laughs>